How is everyone? Can you hear me? Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, I have to, he told me to turn it on right before I came up here. <clears throat> well, it's really a joy to be with you today. And it's also uh, wonderful to follow my friend, Dr. Davidson. Uh, <clears throat> before I uh, actually uh, start getting to the meat of the matter, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information uh, that will give you some resources to go a little bit more in depth about the science of compassion. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Davidson, Dr. Gilbert, uh, Dr. Dodson Lavelle, who are all speaking with us, they have actually been wonderful in that they have contributed with many of the other leading scientists in this nascent field, but ever growing field of compassion science. And I'm pleased to tell you that <clears throat> in the first quarter of 2017, the very first handbook of compassion science will be published by Oxford University Press. And this will have the uh, research in a variety of domains in this space, uh, the latest research, and what is happening on the forefront of this area. So hopefully, as your interest grows in this field, uh, you will take a look at that. It's hard to follow Dr. Davidson. Many of the things I'm going to say are going to overlap, but hopefully this will be additive and sort of remind you about some of these things. Also, I wanted to um, mention that there are a few other papers that are coming out of our group that might also be of interest. One of the challenges <clears throat> with this field is that there are a variety of interventions. And actually, it's sort of hard to know what they are, where they are, and who's doing them. Have any of you had that experience? Exactly. So uh, there's a paper that's actually uh, just been published in the Journal of Psychology and Psychotherapy uh, by uh, my fellow, James Kirby, called Compassion Interventions, the Program Evidence and Implications for Research and Practice. And I would also say, hopefully, that will be a wonderful resource as well. And Dr. Kirby and I are actually also in the process of completing a publication called uh, Compassion, a Public Health Approach to Improve Well-Being. As you can see, uh, this whole field is growing, and over the last few years, it has exponentially grown. Um, but I would suggest to you there are a few challenges here. Before I go into those, though, one of the major challenges uh, is what is the training we are talking about, right? Uh, it seems as though there are many different definitions of mindfulness and compassion practice or interventions. As an example, we have uh, that classic that uh, really has been advocated, developed, brought to the West from John Kabat-Zinn. And <clears throat> actually, Kristen Neff, who has been the pioneer in this field of self-compassion, has actually addressed this in some ways, which I think is interesting. Of course, we know that part of this is the development of attention or presence or being present. And that seems to be a critical component in addition to this aspect of non-judgmental self-awareness or allowing these experience or thoughts to go by without having an emotional attachment. Those two things, which you could call M1 and M2, make up classic mindfulness. Now, I've been in many conversations with John Kabat-Zinn, and he will tell you, and I disagree with him, but he will tell you that it is implicitly understood that compassion is a component of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, I would say that may be true, but the challenge, at least for me, and when I look at this literature, is that in a subset of people, mindfulness practice actually can be without compassion, 
there are examples, and I'll just uh, tell you about an article in the Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> it's with, by a hedge fund manager. They're interviewing him. And he requires that all of their employees do mindfulness practice. Do you think there's a single word about compassion in that? And their interest is actually this idea of attention and focus, which is wonderful. But it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with compassion. So what it does, it makes them very efficient and potentially more ruthless type A personalities. It doesn't make them connect better with others necessarily. It doesn't make them compassionate. It doesn't make them kind. And we have seen this in a variety of reports. So this is why my own path led me to have an interest. And in fact, as Kristen F was, she was sort of making these four components of compassion practice or an intervention and defining them, if you put M1 and M2, which were the first two I described, M3 is this idea of learning compassion for yourself and then ultimately gaining insights and wisdom that allows you to be <coughs> compassionate to others as the fourth, fourth type. So the challenge is when we look at this research sometimes, it's difficult to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. The other challenge here, at least for me, is that does one person's measure that they're using as a surrogate for compassion, because there is no direct scale, compassion scale per se, is that equivalent to someone else's? As an example, we have um, Self-compassion scale, empathy scale, depression and anxiety scale, and people use, and these are self-report scales that people use in reports to say their intervention per se is, is worthwhile. Then you have <coughs> physiologic measures. So in your particular intervention, uh, do you use cortisol levels? Do you use uh, surrogates of the immune response or inflammation to determine if your intervention is worthwhile? Or do you use uh, brain function or uh, brain metabolism? And this is what can make many of these things hard to interpret. So on the one hand, while certainly in the paper, it may define what the intervention is. But how do you compare that necessarily to another paper that seems to be interesting when their practice is quite different? And then again, what is it out of all these different options for measuring as surrogates for compassion uh, are the ones that are really hard and really mean something? Because as you may know, in the field of psychology, uh, there are some people and there's some published data that says half of these studies uh, you cannot either reproduce or the interpretations uh, can be significantly di different depending on who reviews the data. So where are we? And this is uh, perhaps I'm not the smartest guy in the world but this is the dilemma that I have oftentimes in looking at some of these things. But that being said, there are some things that we know. I would like to say that while I mentioned that we don't actually have a compassion scale, uh, my colleagues, uh, James Kirby and Stan Stendhal and Emma Seppala have actually uh, been validating, and this will be published pretty soon, on a compassionate motivation and commitment scale that it seems may actually be a manner in which we can more directly measure compassion, at least in regard to self-report. Um, the other 
interesting thing, though, I think, is that what we have learned about compassion is that, like happiness, probably 50% is genetic and the other is environment. And what Richie alluded to and what many of you know in terms of these practices, like happiness, we have a thermostat, if you will, because few of us have actually maximized our potential for compassion. And through these types of practices, it seems, like was alluded to by Dr. Davidson, that we can take this muscle and through exercise, repetition and intention, actually potentiate our capacity for compassion as far as we're genetically uh, wired. And clearly, this wiring is an innate part of us. The issues here, which I would like to focus on in terms of mentioning some of these studies, I'm actually going to do it in sort of the domain space and tell you what I think I know, but I don't absolutely know because I don't think we have enough information yet. But the way I look at this space of compassion is in various domains. And I'll just go through with it with you. So the first domain is the individual. We appreciate, and certainly I think everyone in this room, that not only are we suffering, but everyone is suffering. And our capacity to alleviate that suffering in ourselves requires us, and I don't think there's any controversy, requires us to develop this M1 and M2, if you will, as the basis for developing compassion. And this is essential traditional or typical mindfulness practice. You have to attend. The challenge with that, as uh, Richie alluded to, is that with a theory of, or excuse me, with a perception of a future and a realization of a past, this is the challenge for all of us. Because probably over 70% of the time, we are not really present, are we? Where are we? We are ruminating on the past, what I could have done, should have done, might have done, or ruminating or at least thinking about or being distracted by a future that has not yet happened. And that's one of the challenges of being present. So I think we can say with a fair degree of certainty based on the science and based on your own experience that a mindfulness practice allows you to be present. There is no question about that. And there are innumerable studies and a vast amount of scientific support for that. So in the context of the individual, we know that by doing mindfulness practice combined with the compassion practice, which I think is really the, if you will, the best type of practice, that several things happen. And again, this is uh, uh, findings that I think are pretty hard and we can hang our hat on. One is that by doing these types of practices, we are able to engage this part of our autonomic nervous system, which is this bidirectional um, road, if you will, uh, through the vagus nerve to our heart. And we know that with these practices that you can have a profound effect from shifting from this threat response associated with our sympathetic nervous system to engaging our parasympathetic nervous system, which as you probably know is the system we call the rest and digest system. This is the system that is associated with affiliative behavior, 
when we are in this space, our heart rate goes down, our blood pressure goes down, our stress hormones go to baseline, and our immune system is boosted because stress hormones suppress the immune system. So we can, I believe, hang our hat there. The other interesting thing is that there are technologies that have been developed, and at Stanford we've actually had a compassion and technology conference where we look at some of these new developments. Now, it's interesting because I will tell you, I probably get 10 requests to review mindfulness apps uh, probably every week. And they're all pretty much derivative and there's not a whole lot there. Uh, uh, and in fact, very few of them have really become sticky at all. But one thing that seems to be effective is um, something called, uh, have you heard of heart math or heart rate variability? So we know that interbeat variability uh, can have a profound effect on cardiac function. Do you know what I mean by interbeat variability? No. I don't need this shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what happens is, let's say you have a heart rate of 70, and you do not have variability of how those beats are going out of the 70. So let's say in a minute, your heart rate even though over a minute, the number of beats you have is 70, they're not necessarily evenly spaced, okay? What we know is that heart rate variability can be influenced by breathing, engaging your parasympathetic nervous system, and when you were able to increase your heart rate variability, which may seem illogical, your cardiac function works at its best. When you have less heart rate variability, it's the opposite, obviously. The lack of heart rate variability is one of the leading causes of sudden cardiac death. Okay. And we know, through the types of practices you engage in, that you can actually increase your heart rate variability and in fact, heart math uh, and others who use heart rate variability have tools that actually show you and train you to very specifically uh, increase your heart rate variability. So there is actually a technology. Now there is some controversy because uh, heart math, uh, the, organiza or the organization or corporate entity actually was founded by a fellow who has brought together a group of people who've lived in community for the last 20 years, and some people think it's a cult, but that's a potentially complete other story. Uh, but it has limited somewhat in this literature getting into top tier journals. But I would leave you with that there is no question that heart rate variability is, imp or increased heart rate variability can be trained and it has a huge, huge impact. The other thing that I think we know is that a number of diseases are a result of inflammation, okay? And in fact, cardiac disease, a number of people would argue, uh, is really a disease of inflammation. We know, I believe, that with the practices that we, or you do, uh, that by giving people a set of tools that decrease their anxiety, decrease their stress, decrease their potential for depression, and in fact, there's a body of literature that supports this in regard to depression even, that actually you were able to decrease the epigenetic uh, uh, occurrence of inflammation. And when you do that, 
This has a significant effect on cardiac function, how the peripheral vascular system functions, and ultimately that in and of itself has an effect on long-term health and longevity. So we have the ability to decrease inflammation. We have the ability to support or boost the immune system. And we have the ability to train ourselves to engage our parasympathetic nervous system and decrease the expression uh, of uh, cortisol and other stress hormones that have a profound, profound deleterious effect on our health. One of the problems that we have as a species is that we were never meant to be here today in this environment, right? Evolution goes really, really slow. Technology goes really, really fast. Our sympathetic nervous system works when we at best and how it was designed, and remember our DNA has not changed in the last 200,000 years. Our sympathetic nervous system was made to respond to a threat and release all of these agents and have all of these effects such as increasing your heart rate, uh, constricting your uh, blood vessels, diverting blood from your uh, abdominal organs to your musculature, and then it allows you to run off, and if you survive, that's great, and if you don't, it doesn't really matter, does it? Uh, so, uh, and then come back to your baseline where you have actually your parasympathetic nervous system engaged, which is really our default mechanism for functioning. And in modern society, what has happened is that we have too many distractions, which uh, Richie was talking about, and these distractions such as cell phones, such as having requirements to engage with lots of people, having jobs, having artificial light, having extended light hours, all affect our stress response. And what we have found is that when that happens, it has a profound effect on our mental and physical well-being, and in fact, uh, ultimately on our longevity. So the great thing is that compassion practice, if you will, appears to, in a very positive way, allow us to not have the same type of emotional response to events that are surrounding us. And what does this sound like? This sounds like having attention, not responding to all this data that's coming at you that you're ill-prepared to uh, process and being able to relax, be centered, and then reflect, be compassionate to yourself. And the very nature of that action of being compassionate to yourself allows you then to be compassionate with others, which puts us into our baseline or our default mode, which fundamentally is this issue of basic goodness. We, as a species, are designed to care for our offspring. Uh, and later, as we went into other hunter and gather tribes, to recognize the suffering of the individuals in that group because their suffering potentially puts the group at risk. And this is how we were uh, wired to function. And the practices that we do with compassion practices have now been shown to allow us to better function in modern society by being aware of those and, if you will, actually hacking your brain for happiness in some ways. But here's one of the downsides. Uh, and I was talking about domains. We went through the individual, but let's go through business. Do most of you believe that when businesses talk about bringing mindfulness into their corporations, do you believe it actually is in their interest or their belief that they're doing it just to be nice? How many people believe that? 
I don't know what company do you work for. <laughs> and, and I'm just bringing up some aspects here for you to think about. Because my limited experience in a capitalist society, as an example, look at Google. Uh, this is a very, very stressful work environment. And most of these kids are between the ages of 20 and 25, 30. And it's such an honor to be there. And these are very accomplished kids. And they're very hardworking kids. Well, do you think it's healthy to work 80 or 90 hours a week? No. And my point is that sometimes we find that there is a self-interest here to make you not be as concerned about yourself and to give you this artificial sense that you're calm and you're not reacting. But sometimes it's not the best thing in the world. Look at the healthcare environment, though. We are doing some wonderful things there. But again, we've created a system, at least in America. It is not a system, first of all, of wellness, right? It's a system of illness. And with the constriction in terms of spending and these other issues, we have an epidemic of burnout. And uh, what we have found, and we've just completed a study with the fifth largest healthcare provider in the United States, that a practice that we have developed at Stanford, but others are also using similar types of practice, can really have a profound effect on this issue of burnout and giving you increasing ability to be resilient in these environments. So we know that that's real. If you look at the uh, business environment, though, getting back to that, we know that when corporations incorporate some of these practices, though, in the right way, where you create trust and a cooperative environment and initiate these practices with good intention, it actually allows the individual to be more productive. It allows the individual to actually uh, be more creative and actually gives the individual meaning. And what happens is at the end of the day, from those things, it increases shareholder value and stock price. And actually, studies have been done that show that. And then very quickly, the other areas that I just want to mention is, unlike Norway and the Scandinavian countries, where you have an enlightened view of the criminal justice system, in America, we do not have a restorative justice system. We have a retributive where we uh, uh, punish them severely and are not interested in their uh, true re rehabilitation. And what that does is it increases violence and increases recidivism. There are a variety of studies now that have been done that when we bring these practices, when we recognize the individual's dignity, when we look at them as an equal and recognize their humanity, and give them these types of tools, it decreases recidivism, it decreases violence, and it makes them reconnect with their own humanity. And that's an extraordinary thing. If you look at the criminal justice system, uh, and again, unfortunately reflecting on America, we have a system that oftentimes incarcerates people for reasons that are unclear or that are not fair we have a private prison system. Do you really believe that most of the people in prison are there because they're evil? They're there because they have not had love and nurturing. And when we're able to give them this through our practices, the tools that you have to improve people's lives, it can be extraordinary. And in fact, not only are there studies being done in, the, in terms of incarcerated individuals, but actually now, we are trying to go from a militarized police force to a kind police force. Because it's when it's militarized, it's us against them versus us recognizing the other. And so now, in police departments in a variety of locations, phys, uh, police officers are being trained in compassion practices. And it has a profound, profound effect. So this just gives you an overview. Um, I will end with just a comment or two. How many of you are familiar with artificial intelligence? 
and machine learning. So I recently uh, hosted a conference on this topic, and the conference was about can you create a compassionate robot, right? And I tell you that this whole issue is really coming to the forefront, and it's one that you really have to think about because robots do what we tell them to do. Uh, most, have you, I don't know if you're aware, but sometimes computer scientists can have an Asperger's type of, uh, are you? Uh, <laughs> well, if you have difficulty with processing emotional states yourself, well, how can you be expected to create <laughs> algorithms that actually are compassionate? But to make a long story short, these corporations are now, including moral philosophers and uh, uh, actually even religious people and ethicists in the team that actually designs these algorithms. So extraordinarily, this is actually a context where the humanities combine with the science to do wonderful things. So overall, there is great hopefulness in the practice that each of you are engaged in. And the work that you do is actually, I would suggest, a spiritual practice. Our ability to look at the other and recognize ourself in the other is and being able to hold that, that is what gives meaning in life, and that is what defines our humanity. So thank you for doing what you do.